Well, praise the Lord. Always good to see everyone. And I think it's rather obvious what the Lord wants us to get our attention today, don't you think? It's one thing when you have someone who is a full age and the Lord calls them home. It's another thing when suddenly, unexpectedly, someone who's young is taken from you. How many of us really believe today in the song that we so often sing, nothing can happen outside of God's will? You think there really is a purpose that this is not just some random thing that has happened? I believe with all my heart that God is, is wanting perhaps to get our attention in a very special way because something like this affects all of us in different ways. And we have a God that wants to get our attention in very, like I say, in very particular personal ways. And so that's what I'm trusting that He's going to do, and I believe He's going to do it. You know, uh, we had a, a wonderful gathering on Wednesday evening, and one of the thoughts that was central and was shared very clearly was centered around the word hope. And somehow my mind has come back to that, and, and that seems to be, in fact, if you want to put a title, I guess that's as good a one as any, just the word hope. Because how many of you believe that God wants to have a people who have hope? Now, you know that we use that word in everyday English in a very different sense than the Bible uses it, than God uses it in His Word. When we say, I hope, we mean I wish. I have a fond desire. I, we're going for a picnic. I hope it doesn't rain. But we're not, there's, there's no certainty in when we tend to use the word hope. There's no certainty in it. But when God uses the word hope in the word, He's talking about a certainty about something that has not happened yet. Okay? And uh, I, I would have to start by saying, I hope, <laughs> I have a fond wish that everyone here, that no one here would possibly, or who hears this, would repose their hope in this world. I can't imagine anything any, any crazier as you look upon this world and then you, then you suddenly see what's, what's happened just a week ago with it no one expected. No one has a promise of tomorrow, do we? We don't have a promise of our next breath. We simply don't know. And, uh, you know, I, I was thinking of a scripture that we often use, and we'll see. It's been suggested to me that I cut this short. We'll see about, see about that. But anyway, I want to have what the Lord has. But it, it doesn't need to go on and on either. You know, when you think about a word hope, you don't have any lack of scripture for it, do you? The question is trying to, you know, what does the Lord actually want to emphasize and what does He want to say? But one of the scriptures that is often referred to on an occasion like this is from, I believe it's 1 Thessalonians 4, when it talks about how we don't, when, when it's dealing with death, okay? And he's talking specifically about those who sleep in Christ, those who die knowing the Lord. He says, we do not, uh, what's the word? Grieve, thank you. We don't grieve as those who what? Isn't that an interesting expression to throw in there? Do you realize, do we realize that the people of this world have zero hope? If you're standing back and looking at it from, the, from eternal point of view, there is not a single person on this planet who does not know Christ who has any hope. Now, you may have plans, you may, you may see how you're, you believe your life is going to work out, and this is what you want, and this is what you seek. But when it comes to the end, that's it. You know, uh, Solomon, I believe, was the greatest king in all of history, but he was also the wisest man in all of history because, other than Jesus, but he was wise because God gave him an ability to be able to observe. And particularly... In the book of Ecclesiastes, 
He was enabled to look around at human society and try to say, what matters? Answer the question, what's it all about? How can I find meaning and significance in this world? And what was his conclusion? It's all vanity. It's all meaningless. And if you want to read, I was going to read it, I don't think I will, but if you want to read a depressing passage of a few scriptures, uh, look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. When he talks about looking around the world, he says, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor or good or whatever, everybody comes to the same end. You all die. That's it. And, and the dead can't contribute to life on earth. I mean, it's, they're gone. Their memory's even forgotten most of the time. And uh, he even makes the comment that a living dog is better than a dead lion. But I mean, you think about, if you dwell upon what he was allowed to observe when you're just simply re, you know, considering only life on earth and not the things of God, it's pretty depressing. How many of you believe God wants us to be depressed? No, but we, he wants us to be real. He wants us to be able to look around and get a, get a clue. And many times he has to do something like what's just happened to get our attention. Because, number one, there are people whose entire life, their minds, their hearts are so entwined in this world that this is where they are pursuing what they call their hope, their expectation. Well, God needs to get your attention if you're in that category. If your life is about what you can accomplish and experience here and get and do and all of that, a name you can leave for yourself, your life is going to come to a, to a zero in the end. That's not okay. This is zero in this case. It will be absolutely meaningless because apart from Christ, there's no such thing as hope. And uh, as I say, the word hope in Scripture is not a wish. It is, a, it is a, an expectation. It's something that, we, that has not happened yet, but we are confident that it will happen. And I believe with all my heart, God wants to impart that in a deeper sense to all of us. Now, if you don't know him, man, you, that's, there is number one. That's the number one thing you should be looking at in your life. You, if you don't know him, God wants to remind you, you don't have any promise of tomorrow. You have no promise that you will live another day and any of your plans come to fruition. But God wants you to know that there is such a thing as a hope and an expectation that is good. Oh, may God help us. But yet, God's people can get kind of sleep, sleepy. We can kind of forget and kind of get enmeshed in the world and go to sleep. Do you think maybe God might want to wake us up to what's, what matters? Yeah, I, I believe it. God has a reason. It's obvious that something like this has affected us in many different ways. Well, I thought of a lot of scriptures, but let me just see if I can focus on what the Lord wants to focus on. The book of Titus begins with some interesting scripture because it, it deals with hope. But I believe it begins to introduce the fact that the hope that, we, that anybody can have that is really hope, something we can, we can confidently look forward to and know it's going to happen, there's only one way it comes, and that's from God himself. All right? So now we get a glimpse into God's heart. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle, that means a sent one, of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. That's an interesting expression, and I won't go into, into it, but if we have a knowledge of truth in our heads that doesn't reflect in our lives, we don't have it. Because what God means to do in our lives, yes, is to begin by imparting truth, but boy, it better get down here, and it better make a difference in every reason for which we are alive. Praise God. Praise God. Paul didn't live for the values of this world, did he? He said, for to me... To live is Christ and to die is gain. Boy, what a wonderful position to be in. Where I have meaning here as long as the Lord wants me here. 
But boy, the day he calls me home, man, that's, the, that's wonderful. That's awesome. That's graduation day. Praise the Lord. All right? So the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. All right? In the hope of eternal life. So now you have this confident expectation that this life that is temporary is not all there is. There is a life that goes on and on forever and ever. That's what God wants me to not only know about, but to possess. Do you possess that? How certain are you? God wants a people who have a hope that is not just a wish. I hope it turns out all right. I want to have one that I, that I know. Okay? All right, where does this come from now? In the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, praise God. <laughs> That's a pretty good place to start. You've got a God who doesn't tell lies. He tells nothing but the truth. God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time. So this goes back long before you and I discovered America. This is, this is, re, this is the whole purpose for everything, that God is going to have a people who not only learn to come to know him in this life, in this world, and learn how to navigate it in harmony with his purpose, but we have something, we have a solid basis for having a confidence that this is not the end. Even when the world is living with no real solid ground for hope, there is such a thing. Praise God. Praise the Lord. All right? Which, all right, the God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time and which now, this is Paul writing in the first century, at his appointed season, he has brought to light. All right? It was always his purpose, but there, was, there came a time when, all right, now it's time to tell everybody. Now I want people to actually come to know me and experience this promise that I have, that I have instituted from the, before the foundation of the world. It's brought to light through the preaching and trusted to me by the command of God our Savior. Now one of the central points of this passage is simply the solidness of the promise. Do we have a ground, a real ground, for having this kind of confidence, or is it just make-believe? Do we just decide to believe it and feel good because we do, or is there something that's real? Are we just playing church and having a fantasy world, or is there something real that we can, ba we can bank on? Praise God. God wants this to be real. He doesn't want people who just blindly follow something because it feels good. Oh, thank God that there's something that's real. All right? And this reminds us of a scripture that we've, we've noted many times in Hebrews chapter 6, which confirms the same thought. And it talks about how Abraham and others, God made his promise. It says in verse 13, I believe it is 15. Well, I can't quite read it. 13. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. I'll drop this in, folks. If God has planted the faith that leads to eternal life in your heart, you are one of his descendants. It has nothing to do with flesh, whether you're Jew or Gentile. God has a family from all people. And we are, we are absolutely his descendants. That's what this is about. Okay? I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after patiently or waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. So now he looks at human society and says, people swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said. So you're talking about somebody who says, not only do I say something, but I swear by, you know, with my hand on the Bible, or I swear by God, or whatever. They're trying to, trying to lend uh, extra emphasis and, and believability. All right? So that's just a, a reference to what happens here among human society. An oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. 
because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. Boy, that's an awesome thought. God didn't start this, look at you and me and say, I'm changing my mind. They are just too bad. I ain't messing with this, washing my hands of it, walking away. No, the unchanging nature of his purpose. Folks, do we have a ground to stand upon today? Oh, thank God. Thank God for that. The unchanging nature of his purpose, very clear. He wants, he wants this to be clear to you this morning and to me. To the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. Now, why did he do that? God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. All right? So again, there is a reference to the fact that it's impossible for God to lie. But now what are the two things? He says by two things. One of them is the promise. If you've got a promise by somebody who can't lie, that's a pretty strong basis, basis for hope, isn't it? But God said, I'm going to go beyond that. I know that they know I don't lie and they know what I said, but man, I'm going to add something to it. I'm going to add an oath. So that it's the promise itself and the oath are the two things that God has given to us. And you back that up with a God who can't lie? Wow. Do you want to look out at this world and have some sort of hope? Man, the more we look at this world, the more we see the cracks developing. I mean, we could wake up tomorrow and the world be on fire with war. It's that crazy. If you think the American dream is going to go on forever, you are mistaken. There are powerful, I'm not going to get off on this tangent, but there are powerful forces in this world that are tired of America being the dominant nation in this world. They're going to do everything they can to undermine us and bring us down. And it's happening from within and from without. But God wants us to have something that we can count on. That regardless of what happens here, we can know that we know that we know and it's not just some blind wish. There's a solid conviction in our hearts that's as strong as Paul, who was able to say, for to me to live is Christ. You know, whether I live or whether I die, I am the Lord's, he said in one place. Well, that's a good place to be because there's nothing certain except death and taxes, as they say. But praise God. All right, so the two unchangeable things, that's, that's the word and the oath that's, that backs up the word made by someone who can't lie, all right? So we who have fled, what do we fled? This world, sin, our own need, our own utter helplessness. There's not one thing we can do to contribute to what God has done for us. He didn't look at me and find something worthy of saving. I'm completely unworthy. He is completely worthy of all that we could all the glory that we could possibly give him. To him alone be glory. Praise God. All right? We who have fled, we've run from a danger. We have but we have fled to take hold of the hope set before us. May be greatly encouraged. Are you encouraged today? We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Praise God. And I believe God wants every person who has any, who's been influenced and affected in any way by the events that have happened to ask yourself the question, do I have an anchor in my soul? How sure am I? Do you think God wants people to be unsure? Or do you think God wants to get people's attention in a way that we can have a solid ground for hope? Praise God. Once again, it does not depend on you. No one can look in the mirror and say, God favors me because I'm such a good person. 
But no one can look in the mirror and say, I am so bad that he, would, he could never care about somebody like me. Oh, praise God. That's the, the glory of the gospel. The glory of the hope is that there's a God who longs to share his life and his love and his eternity with the people. You got something else to live for? Good grief. That's called blindness. May God open every heart. May God help us as believers to, to recognize the, the hope that he plants in the heart. I'll tell you what, that's, that's, the, that's worth everything. Praise God, that's worth everything to know him. And you look, you look back, it mentions Abraham. You look back at Abraham and what did Abraham have to go on? What, what, what was his foundation for doing what he did? He heard God speak. It was a word of promise, and it does not say he believed the promise. You ever notice that? What did he believe? God. Somehow God made himself known to Abraham in a way that Abraham's faith and confidence was in the person who spoke the promise, not just the words. And that faith was demonstrated in his life. And it talks at the end of chapter 4 of Romans about how he hoped against hope. Boy, everything in the world was allowed to come against that confidence that he had in God's promise. Every possible scenario just about that could have arisen and said, it can't be, you're a fool. And he said, no, I believe God. Bottom line, I believe God. That's what God wants to do in every one of our lives because that's the definition of faith. Praise God. God wants to plant that in every willing heart. And he will. But this is what it looks like in practice. And Abraham was able to to stand fast and believe God in the face of so much that came and went in his life, even to the point when the, the promise of a son was finally fulfilled when Sarah was too old to have a child and he was old. The child came anyway. And then he said, sacrifice that child to me. I bet he was expecting that one. And what did he do? He demonstrated that he wasn't just confident in the logic of the promise. He was confident in the person who spoke that promise. That's what God wants. He wants you to know him. He wants him to be so real in your heart that it doesn't matter what happens or how it happens or when it happens. He's still faithful. There's a rock. There's something that will hold in every single storm and life will be full of them. Praise God. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know who holds tomorrow. That's, that's all of my hope. And so Abraham was strengthened in his faith. He gave glory to God. He was persuaded that God had the power to do what he'd promised. And God said, that's what I'm looking for. I know this guy can't be righteous enough to be acceptable to me and himself. He's got to depend upon me. And that's the whole point. God wants a people who will come to depend 100% on what he has done and promised. To let go of everything else and say, God, I cast myself upon you. I am yours from now into eternity. My life is laid down. My purpose is to be yours. Here's my heart. Here's my life. You do what you alone have the power to do. That's salvation, folks. That's what faith is about. It's not about being religious and making a profession and coming and trying to be a better person. I need, I need him. I need him. And so, you know, it begins in chapter 5. I'll just read a couple of verses because I don't want to get bogged down in any one thing. You could go in a thousand different directions, it seemed like. Therefore, Paul writes, since we have been justified through faith, justified, made righteous in God's, eye, God's eyes, God's taken care of the sin issue, all right? We have been justified through faith. That's how it becomes mine and yours. We have peace with God. Talked about that recently. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith 
into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. You see what God's seeking to bring us into? He mentions faith, which is, which is what God gives us. It's the power to, to repose all of our hope in Him. Faith is God's gift to a willing heart, as I said. It's, a, it's the confidence that, that says, I have no confidence in me. I have no confidence in the world, but I have confidence in Him. He can take me right out of this world and, and change me and make me fit for His purposes. This world will pass away. It's obvious it has an expiration date and things are getting crazier all the time. We see how things are unfolding, but my hope's not here. I'm, I'm just going to serve Him while I am here, but I know, where, I know how this turns out. Like Jimmy Robbins used to say, I've read the last page and it turns out, turns out good. Praise God. God wants us to have that as a solid heart conviction that he alone has the power to plant okay by faith into this grace and remember what's grace grace is god's power at work saving sinners it's not a tolerance of sin it is a power that lifts us out of that and enables us to live for god and it begins to, it gives us the power to be the person that he wants us to be that's what I need. It gives us the power to believe in the first place. Praise God. All right? And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Boy, it's not just that I've got a conviction. Man, I can be confident about it to talk about it. Man, I'm not confident because I'm anything. I'm nothing. I've resigned any hope that I could stand before a holy God in my own righteousness. But I've, I've been given a place before His throne. Oh, to Him be all the glory. We can't lift up ourselves, and we can sure lift up the name of Jesus. It means God saves. That's the meaning of His name. Praise God for all of that. And we know, just, just make a reference to something we've talked about so many times in Ephesians 2. Where does this come from? How do we get a hold of this? It's by grace, through faith, and that not of yourselves. That means... He's not even counting on me to come up with faith. It's not there. My whole natural inclination is to look at me, look at the world, and, tr and struggle and strive to meet natural desires. And he lifts me up to, he wants me to come to a place, number one, where I am totally surrendered to his evaluation of who and what I am. People are not willing to, to come to the conviction I'm a sinner and I have no claim upon a holy God. Has that dawned, ever dawned on you? Has that ever become real to the point where you say, oh God, if you don't do something for me, I'm lost. I'm a goner. I know many people, I've heard your testimonies. You know what I'm talking about. God has to strip us of every hope that we could possibly have in ourselves. But then when he does it, it's never to leave us there, is it? Thank God. It's always to take us to a place where now it's time to look at the cross. Now it's time to look at what I did about your sin. I sent my son, the very one who created you in the, in the first place. He came down. All the sorrows, all the things that you had to experience in this world, he's experienced and he went to the cross in your place. I can be completely righteous to, to let you, to, to accept you as my child because the sin that you committed against me was charged to him and punished. Justice has been served. I think that was the line in one of the songs we just sang. Justice has been satisfied. Praise God. It's such simple truth, but oh, may it dawn on us in a deeper way because God wants this to become real. Why would God allow things like this to happen if it weren't to get our attention and make himself more real? Oh, we're going to look back one day and say, man, look what you did, Lord. That was perfect. I was in a place where I needed to hear your voice afresh. To God be the glory. And so we see how that grace brings us into that relationship and then begins to change us so that while it's not by works, it is unto works. God wants to bring us to a place where now we can live a life that is pleasing to God, but we do it with His strength in us. 
Praise the Lord. Praise God. Well, as I say, there's so many things you could, you could go through here, and Lord, bring them to my mind as to what, which one you want here. Like I say, I don't think we need to stay here forever because there's a lot going on this afternoon. But we're brought into a relationship with him. So where does that go? What is the hope that we have? Romans 8, I think, is the scripture that would be good to go to now. And, I, and there's so much there, I'm not going to go through all of it, but he talks about the condition of the world. We know where this is headed. And he says in 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We've, God's birthed his life in us, but we even, so, even we just, oh God, you know, bring us through. God, this is not, I'm, I'm so glad this isn't the end. This isn't what eternity is about. This is just getting us, to, to, this is working in us to get us ready for that. Oh God, hurry, the, you know, hasten the day. All right? We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly. Why? As we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Oh man, I'm ready for a new body. Some of you young folks, just wait. But the Lord is so faithful. He's merciful, isn't he? But sometimes I think it's a, it's a well, not sometimes, all the time. It's a good thing when we feel our infirmities and we realize it reminds us this is just temporary. There's something else coming. All right? So that's what the, we're looking forward to. For in this hope, there's that word again, in this hope, is that a wish or is that a confident expectation? Do we have a ground to hope for that, to expect that? One of the strongest witnesses is the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ who didn't just go down into that grave and stay there. He came out with a brand new body. And the Word tells us that He was the first fruits from the dead, that we're going to experience the same thing. We're going to have bodies just like His when it's all over. Boy, God has done everything in His... He's done His part to make His Word known and to spread it in people's hearts. If people are sti stiff-necked and, res and resist that, that's on them. But I'll tell you, we have a God who's doing everything in His power to reach hearts. All right? All right, for, we, for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? You know, I've used this silly illustration, but, oh, I hope one day I'll get a Bible. Well, that's kind of silly. I got one. See, hope has to do with the future. Hope is faith directed at something that hasn't happened yet. I guess I'll, it's this direction for you guys. Hope is looking for the future. All right, so what do we do? How does that affect how I live right now? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, what do we do? We wait for it patiently. Now, Oh, God, I don't have the strength to do that. Well, how can I possibly, where do I get the strength to possibly be able to do something like that? It doesn't make sense. What does God expect of me? Oh, let's see what it says here. In the same way, the Spirit helps our weakness. See, there's God reaching right down into our lives, knowing what's going on, knowing our needs, knowing our lack, and He's always right there, to help. Wouldn't it be good to look to him and expect that on a day-to-day -day basis? That's what faith is. That's what living by faith is. Lord, I know I don't have what it takes, but you have promised. And by the way, you don't lie. You have promised to be right here to help me right where I am to give me everything that I need to move forward. I don't feel it. And how many times am I like right where Paul was? I feel my weakness and it's not comfortable. But when I'm weak, his strength is made complete in my weakness. And it reminds me where my help comes from. And there's this constant sense 
God, this is all temporary, but I'm looking to you and you're going to get me through. Your promises are not just to be with me now, but to take me all the way to the end of the age. And that's what I'm counting on. The Spirit helps our weakness. We do not know what, to, what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. God wants you to know today it's not just this generic confidence that, oh God, I know how it's going to turn out. He, he's, he wants you to know He's going to be with you today, every moment, right? However this event has affected you, God's here. And I'm going to throw this, this in. You know, I've, I've coined this phrase, I suppose. I never heard anybody else say it about getting our butts in the right place. Because when things affect us in our lives, there are two ways we can react. If you know the Lord, it's all too easy to say, yes, God is good and He's with us, but I'm struggling. I just, I, I'm, I'm feeling bad, I'm depressed, I'm and, and then, you know, you, you're, you're in that mode. But what, think about the difference of somebody who says, man, I'm struggling and I'm, I'm battling this, all this, but God is faithful and I'm trusting in Him. And the simple point is that whatever follows but is what's in charge in a practical sense in your mind, in your life. I want to be one of those that can be honest about my need right now and how I feel about something, but always go back to put my focus where it needs to be because He is real and He is worthy to be praised. He is in charge. I have every confidence in Him. I have every reason to have confidence in Him. That's what He wants because, verse 28, and we know that in all things. Do you know that? Has God imparted that knowledge to you or is it just a verse you read somewhere and try to feel good because of it? God wants everyone to have that kind of a relationship where he becomes real enough that we know down in here, even when it hurts, even when something is shocking, no matter how we feel about it, even though we do grieve, that's real. Jesus grieved. He knows exactly what that feels like. But he wants us to know that in all these things, God is working for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to our purpose and what we want out of the, Wait a minute. His purpose. His purpose. Whose purpose are you looking for? I want his. I want his. I know that's going to go through ways that, and things that happen that aren't pleasing to human nature, but I also know He's going to be with me all the way to the end. And it's go, in the end, I'm going to look back and say, man, that was exactly what I needed. You knew I needed something right then because you were trying to set me free and I was trying to cling to something. And you wanted to break, hope, break that grip because I was the one that's putting myself in prison. I wouldn't let go. And you loved me enough to do what you did. Praise God. I'll tell you, we serve a God who knows what He's doing. And so you, you go through the passage, which we won't do now. You can read it. But all about the certainty that we have, that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Is that certainty in your heart today? God wants it to be. God wants you to have that confidence in Him. And don't ever forget you know, you go over to, uh, to that passage in 1 Thessalonians 4. That'd be a good, good one to read right now. Because what is our hope? Where is this headed? He talks about the fact that we're waiting for something that's going to change our bodies permanently. We're going to have brand new bodies. That's what he's talking about here. Brothers and sisters, verse 19, 13, whatever it is. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. 
for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. See, there's the witness. There's God's testimony to every single one of us is what happened to his son, is a, is a picture of where he's taking us. All right, he rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede or go ahead of those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. Lord, anytime. <laughs> Praise God. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And he uses, I'm not going to go forward in the passage, he talks about the state of what's going to happen to the world when that happens. It's going to be destroyed. But God hasn't appointed us to that. But there's a, he uses the word hope once again in that passage. You know, I thought about all of this, and I felt like there needed to be an emphasis at some point, not just on the facts, because you could put this out there as almost a lecture. Here's what the Bible teaches about hope. These are the doctrines you're supposed to believe. It's got to get beyond that. This has got to be personal. And you know, we are feeling creatures, are we not? We have all kinds of emotions. We don't just, I mean, we're not like data. We don't just run on pure logic. We are, for those of you who know who, know who data was, <laughs> until he got that crazy emotion chip and everything went crazy. <laughs> but seriously, we are feeling creatures. We were created in the image of God. He has feelings. And so the question is, how does God feel about this? How does he feel about the need? How does he feel about your need? Suppose you, listening to me right you whether here or someplace else, suppose you are in this place where you're, you do not, you're not as certain as you would like to be. You don't know. I want you to know, first of all, how God feels about that. You know, we have this expression in today's generation, I think, it's, just become part of our culture, I guess, where someone really doesn't care about something and then there's someone's trying to make a point and they use the word whatever. I mean, it's just become an expression that means I don't care, however it turns out. How many of you think that God is sitting up there saying whatever? You know, make up your mind. Fire or glory, it's up, I don't care. Oh, I'll tell you, God cares. God cares. Look at Noah's day. He didn't just say that the thoughts of every human being was only evil continually, but it, was, it talked about the pain that that caused God. God looked down and there was a pain in his heart because of it. Because he loved them. He wanted them to know. And even when it became certain that judgment was coming and a day was marked on his calendar. He waited 120 years. He took care of his own, didn't he? But the message was still going out. There was still something reaching out. And you remember the course of the nation of Israel. The whole purpose of Israel's history was to focus on the coming of Christ and the establishing of a kingdom that we're still part of today. And, but... But Jesus reiterated what we saw in Daniel that we talked about recently and how the nation itself was going to reject him. And it was going to be full of all kinds of, of bad stuff spiritually. The overspreading of abominations, he calls it. And it's going to, be, it's going to reach a point where God's going to remove his protection. And then we know what happened in history. The Roman armies surrounded Jerusalem and absolutely destroyed it, killed Multitudes of people scattered the rest. 
It was a terrible judgment. And Jesus foretold that in detail, didn't he? But how did he feel about it? Was he just, boy, you're getting what you deserve, you bunch of rebels. I'm so mad at you. I've... Oh, God. Oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. You that killed the prophets, you stoned the ones that I sent to you. How often would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chickens, but you were not willing. And then he pointed to what was coming. But what was he doing? Was he laughing and carrying on like he didn't care? He was weeping. That's God's heart today. He looks down and he sees people that he longs to reach out and just share his love and his mercy and the certainty of what he has provided. He wants every single person listening to this to have that in your heart. And I'll tell you, it can be yours. It can be yours. I think of the words that we often cite in Jeremiah 29, and I'm not going to turn over there particularly, but I think I can get the sense of it. And Jeremiah was prophesying to people who lived in Jerusalem, and there was a remnant of people who actually served the Lord, even though judgment was falling on the nation. And God wanted to encourage them to say, look, this is not the end, I have plans. All right? But I believe with all my heart, those words, the principles lying in those words apply to every generation in history of God's people where he said, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Yeah. No, maybe I should have turned over there. But anyway, plans to give you a hope and a future. But what does that depend upon? He talks about how you're going to seek me and I'll listen. But what's the key? You will seek me and find me when? When you search for me with all your heart. That's what it comes down to. Anybody's heart that is still tied to your life in this world, you're going to miss out. And God's message to you is you're living without hope. You may think you've got wonderful plans. You don't know. I have all ideas that Ryan foresaw how his life was going to unfold as he thought. Child on the way, a career, family, plans. But God had a different idea, didn't he? Maybe he just did that because he loves you so much. Maybe he took somebody home that, was, that, know, that knew him. I mean, from God's point of view, what difference does it make if someone lives to be 19 or 90? You're going to die anyway. That's just life in this world. What, what if God looked and said, the purpose of this young man's life was to, to look like a, a, a vision of a young man full of promise? Lots of ability, lots of all, everything in the world going for him. But I'm going to show, I'm going to show everybody the folly of putting all of your, all of your eggs in the world's basket. Investing all of your time and energy in that. I'm going to show you that that can be taken like that. What would happen if something happened to you and you stopped breathing this afternoon and it was over? God wants that the longing of his heart. I don't know how to convey this except just to say it. The longing of God's heart is for you to know him. Do you want him? You have every right to cry out to him from the depths of your soul until that certainty is there. Not this, oh, I hope it's going to turn out all right. I'm just, I'm, I'm believing the right stuff, so it's probably okay. God wants a certainty, a conviction. That's what biblical hope is. It is a confidence. It is a faith that something that has not yet happened is as certain as if it has happened. Look at Romans 8. Again, 
Right after Romans 8, 28, God talks about those he called, those he foreknew he called. Those he called, he, was it justified? And those he justified, what else did he do? He glorified. Anybody here been glorified yet? No, you still look pretty normal to me. But here's God declaring something that has not happened yet as though it's already happened. I want to live with that kind of certainty, don't you? You won't find anything in this world or in yourself that can give you any kind of hope, but there's a hope today that can be yours if you cry out to Him from the depths of your soul and, re and just believe Him and hand the reins of your life into His hands, He's provided every single thing that you and I need to be able to stand there free from everything that's wrong with this world. And we're going to be, th if we got any crowns, we're going to be throwing them down at the feet of a Savior. You are the one, you're the reason I'm here. I had no hope. I could not look at anything in my life and say, that's why I'm here. It was all you. You loved me enough to go to that cross. Take my guilt upon, you, upon yourself. You had none, but you were willing to die in my place. And then you just didn't leave me to my own strength. You sent your spirit into my heart to give me a new heart and a new life. And then you began to work with me and to teach me how to how to navigate this world, but also not just how to be the person you want me to be, but I had a reason for being here. There were things you wanted me to do to influence other people and to serve the interests of your kingdom. And it all came from you. And then when the time came, when the time was right, I breathed my last and I stepped, into, stepped over to the other side and it was so much better. Isn't that the picture that God wants? That's not just a picture. That's not fantasy, folks. God wants to make this real and alive to every single person. And I believe he wants to ask the question, is that true of you right now? Amen. And if it isn't, you have every right to call upon him and say, oh God, I want to be yours. I want to lay down everything and put my hope in you. Oh God, just come into my heart and change me. I want, this, I want this hope to be in here, not just something that people talk about. I want, I want to be able to, re to realize that if something happened to me today, it would be okay. Because I've, I've handed my life over to somebody who's made promises, and you can't lie, Lord. What an awesome person you are. What an awesome being you are. All of my hope lies in you, and to your name be glory. To your name alone be glory. Well, perhaps that's, that's enough today. I know people will need time to get, to get together, those who are going to be up at the meeting. But just pray. Pray for Steve. I know he feels the burden and desires to have God's Spirit upon him, and I believe he will. You know, I'm, I'm slowly learning that you can't come into these situations where you're expected to speak and and just, you know, live in a state of panic about it. We have to come to a place where we say, Lord, you've arranged this. I'm just turning it over to you. I have nothing to offer you but weakness. But here it is. Go for it. That's, isn't that how he wants every one of us to live? You got what it takes? I don't. But he does. To him be the glory. Let's pray for this afternoon that God will accomplish everything he has accomplished. Every, that means to accomplish Everything that he has in mind and taking Ryan at such a young age and getting our attention. But every young person who has never come to this place realize what's at stake and get your eyes off of your plans and your expectations in this world. God wants to plant an expectation that is certain. It's as certain as he is. And he wants you to know him. And, to, and experience His love and His mercy. To Him be all the glory and all the praise. Praise God. Praise the Lord.